shoot, whenever you shoot the arrow at that target, that's your aim in life. Well, what's our aim in life? To be the best we can be. Sometimes you're in life and you're shooting and all of a sudden you look at something that seems like it's an easier target, it's closer. It could be a girl, it could be drinking, it could be smoking. It's whatever it is you start going, man, this makes me feel better in the moment. And then what do you lose sight of? The thing you were aiming at that you said, hey, that's what means most to me. That's the thing that's the most important to me. Why am I shooting at the thing I want for the moment and losing sight of the thing I want most? That's why doing the right thing or aiming at the right target is hard and going to getting into pleasure is easy. Which one makes us feel the best long term? The suffering that we go through or grow through to become what it is we were meant to be. What it is now is you have to persevere and you have to suffer and you have to go through that gap between who you are and who you want to be. this i come in first 10 minutes is like that they were doing the snoop sun show whatever the deal was the guy started shooting the camera i do it on a weekly basis it's the most important thing when the guys walk in the weight room i go where's your mind at let's start talking about your aim and i heard these things about your life and i mean this with i'm in college now i do it with the college guys it's the same thing the guys see me walk in with a piece of paper they know if they walk up and their attitude and their disposition is a certain way i will confront it immediately and we go into a 10 minute talk about life up here, what's the number one tool you need to, to maximize potential? The number one thing that gives an athlete the greatest opportunity to maximize their growth potential is developing a disciplined life. Now, tell me this, too. And you, if discipline is one of the biggest things that prevents people from maximizing their potential, what keeps us from talking about it more? And when I say talking about it more, I'm talking about implementing it in every opportunity that we get and everything that we do when we're talking, so that's the thing that shortcuts a guy's potential. Then I can talk to him about rate of force development. I can even out his muscle link tension discrepancies. I can say, hey, listen, let's, let's activate your stretch shortening cycle and reduce reciprocal inhibition. Let's go through all this other stuff. But if he doesn't have discipline, how's he going to maximize it? And so for me, when we come in, there's three tools of discipline I talk about over and over again. Principle-centered thinking. There are laws, universal laws, that govern human growth. It's just true. You apply them, your life grows. You don't apply them, your life doesn't grow. They're universal principles. You think, you reap what you sow, all right? Whatever you reap is what you're gonna end up sowing. I'll come and ask a person a question, and we'll talk about principle of love. And I'll say, hey, what does it mean to love yourself? What is love? And is love a feeling or a decision? Decision. decision. Anyone else, any other thoughts? Feeling or decision? Decision. Okay, absolutely. This is the truth. And if I talk about it, I go, well, look at, I'll tell them, hey, Hebrews 12, 6. You know, the Lord disciplines those he loves. And I go, hey, if I love you, then I'm going to discipline you. That's just the truth. I got kids. I go, if I don't discipline you, I don't love you. The two are hand in hand. And when I say discipline, I don't mean being punitive and hurting. I'm talking about challenging and holding accountable. Well, the, the inverse holds true on that too. If I love you, then I discipline you. If I love myself, then I will discipline myself. If I do not discipline myself, I am not loving myself. It's black and white. And the degree in which I discipline myself is the degree in which I can maximize my potential. So the reality, when we come in and we start talking about being principal center, I always ask the same question. Are you really loving yourself? If you're your biggest investment, and you won't pour into yourself, but you come in and you talk to me and say, I feel like you don't believe me. I feel like you, well, dude, what, what about last night when you went and made these decisions? What about when you came in here and you got all negative? Dude, it sounds like you're the one who has a hard time with holding the principle that builds your life and the life of the people around you. And you want to talk to me about that, but don't. The biggest thing you need to do is get principle-centered. You need to start learning how to really love yourself, and I mean this, me included. Most people, especially when you're young, that's not something they teach you in class. It's something you learn along the way, and it's vital to an athlete's development and the maximization of his potential. The other thing, self-awareness. People becoming aware of themselves without feeling condemned. 
Nowadays, man, it's about, hey, don't hurt little Johnny. Little Johnny's self-esteem. He doesn't want to feel bad. And he's going to get on his Twitter account and put the two best plays he's got on the Twitter account so everyone can see it. And he wants to feel good. He wants all the followers to come follow him and make him, Johnny feel good about himself. And I go, this is the truth. When you sit down, you evaluate yourself. You give yourself the greatest opportunity for growth because you can see where you fall short and where you need to grow in. Avoidance of it is just shortcutting your growth. And so we talk about self-awareness. It'll be things like guys' perspective. A guy will come in and say to me, hey, coach, I'm, I'm just ticked. I go, I know, dude, you look terrible out of practice last two weeks. What's the deal? And he goes, man, I'm just ticked, man. They moved me to second string, and I'm just pissed off, and I'm just mad, and I just feel like, what's the point? And the guy says, what's, and then I say, is that really your thinking? So you got moved to second string, and your response to being moved to second string was, I'm going to do less. I'm not going to go as hard. I'm too discouraged to keep trying to be the best. And I'm hoping things will be different. I said, man, that's absurd. Dude, you're guaranteeing yourself with that decision that you will remain number two. Or even worse, someone will get hurt and you will have to go in. You will let the whole community down. Because you made decisions not to maximize who you were as a person. Your thinking is broken. You need to evaluate it. And we sit down, we start evaluating. What is that thinking rooted in? What would be more constructive to building your life? And then we walk through the process. Last thing is learning to take responsibility. Life is a culmination of decisions that you make every day. That's just the truth. It's not what happens. You give me the word responsibility. Response able. Are you able to respond? It's not what's happening. Am I able to respond to what's happening? What's happening to me is inconsequential. What will ultimately help me grow is how I respond to what's happening to me. Do I make constructive or destructive decisions? When I go, well, listen, I got to sit down with athletes, and I'm talking about this on a regular basis. I mean, I got some pro guys that come in. We talk about the same thing. I ask them the same question. Dudes, you have to learn how to take responsibility. You got to start learning how to respond to life in a way that builds your life, not tears it down. And the bottom says the road to life is a disciplined life. Ignore correction, and you're lost for good. At the, you could say the road to, road to maximize your potential is a disciplined life. If you don't, you'll lose it for good, because this is the other reality, too. The human body is depreciating as you get older. So you only have a certain window to compete in. So it's going, so are you going to optimize your opportunity now and who you're meant to be? Because it's not going to be there forever. I know. I played, it came, and it went. It jumped in faster than it started. And I go, what's your decision? At the end of the day, are you going to have a disciplined life, and are you going to maximize the opportunity you have to make the most out of yourself? Because it is time sensitive, and there's a window and you got to maximize it. These are things I'll put up. I'll read this real quick. We'll go through it. It says, the world is full of naturally brilliant people who never rise above mediocrity because they won't, they will not make the sacrifice which superiority requires. He lacks the strength of leadership, the fullness of knowledge, the soundness of judgment, which can only be built up bit by bit through years of painstaking toil. They are too lazy and self-indulgent to propel themselves to the top. Their ambitions may not be beyond their capacity. It's not beyond their talent level, but they are beyond their discipline. Hey, think about that. That it's not beyond the person's capacity. It's not beyond our capacity, our ability to do it. It's beyond our ability to discipline ourselves. So one of the biggest things before we move on to the physical, when I sit down, it becomes the most pivotal thing. How do I get someone's mind to buy in? And even where I'm at now, one of the biggest things is changing the culture and coming in and saying, hey, what you do is relevant because you're a part of it. And the degree in which you build and maximize your talent will be the level of quality that you have in your life and the level of quality that you experience in the relationships around you. And it's your decision and you're responsible for making it happen. Going on, now we talk about physical development, which is performance enhancement, which is why most folks are up in here, understand a certain level of performance. Biggest thing for me, I got four pieces that go into it, foundational work, adequate strength baseline, power work, which for me in particular, rate of force development, and peak or high speed work, all right? Foundation work, absolutely crucial. Man, I was, thank God I went to the high school level for a while because when I came out of uh, professional ball, I never really learned how to break things down uh, pattern-wise, because usually you're, you're talented enough to kind of compensate or use these movement strategies that allow you to work around it, right? So I go into this high school, you got to teach the guy with two left feet how to come off the ball and how to be able to do different things. I mean, 
And so you're teaching this guy movement patterns, basically. And, you know, in the computer world, in the gaming world, these guys all come in with these super underdeveloped posterior chains, and they're like this, no glute activation, overactive hamstrings. And you're looking at these guys and going, how do I help this guy learn how to get into proficient movement patterns? So the biggest thing we'll focus on, I do it six to eight weeks. Even at UNLV when I walked in, they were shocked. I still went four weeks in terms of just developing. We did assessment. We did mobility, stability, flexibility, and correctives. I'm big on correctives. I don't get lost in the rabbit hole of correctives, but I do look and say, for me personally, plan-wise, um, I have a pronated ankle. It rotates internally, okay? So obviously, how do you tear your ACL? You got internally rotated femur. Tibia stays the same. You step on it. You got this vulgus. You do what? You tear your ACL, all right? So I had a predisposition propensity to it, so I kept tearing my ACL. Well, no one, no one told me that, and it was a structural alignment deal. So by the third surgery, fourth surgery, um, fifth surgery, it started to be an issue. And I never corrected it. So now when I come in, that's influenced me. And I go, hey, how do we look at guy's kinetic chain and assess them? This is super important. Is there vulgus? Is there immobility at the hip? Because any immobility in the joint here, the, the joint below it or above it becomes vulnerable. So any immobility creates instability in the joint above or below, correct? So you go, I got immobility in my hips. Where am I vulnerable? Knees and... Low back. So a guy starts going, man, my back's bothering me. My back's bothering me. I just got a text today, my back's bothering me. I said, no, it's not. It's your flexors. You got overactive flexors. You've been getting down your stance. We've been spring ball for a week. You had overactive flexors. We shut your flexors. I get a text back, uh, thanks, coach. You know, he's thinking, man, my, it's my back. It's not. It's a compensation, right? He's got these overactive hips. So we come in, we do those assessments. Where are you overactive? How do we restore muscle link tension relationship? It's a big deal to me. How do we restore functional movement pattern? How do we build technical proficiency in acceleration, deceleration, jumping, and lifting? How do we do that? And this is the thing. Just because you play bro ball and you have the talent doesn't mean you necessarily have the best movement strategies. And a lot of times what they can do is they leave you vulnerable. And so you go, why fix it? Man, that guy runs a 4-3 anyway. And I go, well, you can't really fix it. He does run a 4-3. He's highly successful. But if I can decrease his chance of injury by 1%, is it worth it? Is it valuable? Yeah, and it is to me at the end of the day. And it says, um, going on, this is a video. This is Ronnie Stanley. who's was a sixth pick. Baltimore Ravens two years ago, AFC uh, Rookie of the Year. And this is us going through his corrective patterns. Quadri. Quadri. Groiner stretch. So do an eccentric lowering with a band floss. Once again, every day when he walked in, this was his warm up. Lateral oblique. You can see him shaking and watch his low back when he gets ready to go, you'll see it on his left side. You'll see it start to shake and start to go. So everything we did worked on strengthening the, the QL, especially on the left side right here, and stretching the one on the right side. I do the same thing with the athletes at UNLV. We'll assess 25, 30 guys. They come with their sheets. They got to do the same thing. They walk in the weight room. This is their warm-up. They got 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. This is their warm-up. And we go. Weak low back. You can see it when he's doing his overhead squat. Overactive trap. Recruits from the trap. Weak rhomboid. So now you'll see, we we'll activate the rhomboid. I'll keep his traps down when he's doing his movements. One, two, three. Left glute in particular, not well activated. You can see he's having a hard time going to extension. This helps him going to hyperextension. 30 second calf stretch. Seven, six, five, eight, nine, ten. Just warm up. One of the biggest things, and people can say, Whatever they want. He came in, he ran a 1-8 going into the combine. 
when he got ready to leave from the facility, we got done. He ran a 166, and everyone said, man, what'd you do? Was it plyometrics? Was it this thing? Was it that thing? Was it these different things? I said, nah, man, I just worked on his compensations, literally. And he did correct, he just activated the things that were underactivated, and that was the biggest thing we went in there and did. And he dropped down to a 166. He was already super talented. The thing that was hurting him was he couldn't use all the horsepower. Body just wouldn't let him. Tendon and ice was a bunch of stuff that was happening to his body in response to his imbalances, and all I had to do was just even it out and get it to let off, and then he just dove into his horsepower and it automatically went back down to 166 at three, you know, 330. On this one, these are the hip mobility that we come in and do every day, same thing. This routine, we do it for four weeks, six weeks in high school, four weeks at UNLV. Try and get a deeper stretch. Internal hip rotation. We test the guy's internal, external hip rotation. How much internal? You're supposed to have 45 each way. You don't. We're working on it. Squat. This is what guys do before they do anything. Can you just squat properly on a wall? I do it in college too. Can he externally rotate his knee? External hip stretch. And you see the guys in the background doing all the different exercises, they come in and for 45 minutes to 50 minutes for the first month, that's all anyone does. Buddha squat with rotations. Building thoracic rotation out of the squat position. Alternating straight leg raise. So regular band hip floss out of Kelly Starrett's book, Supple Leopard. We do a bunch of flossing. Scap retraction. Integrated work, upper body, lower body working together. Build intermuscular coordination. Lateral squat, anti rotation, shoulder extension. You've seen Ronnie Stanley doing this in his warm-up. This is the whole series. They go into four different stations. Each one of these is a station. They perform these movements. Adductor Magnus stretch. Intrinsic stabilizer activation. This is one of the old linemen. We do a band hip activation series. External rotation focus.
single leg overhead good morning with PVC pipes. Once again, I do the same thing in college. The guys come in and do this exact same thing. Kinetic chain, how do we build stability, especially posteriorly? Transitional hurdle mobility. One step in the box and under. One step in the box and under. Then I'll put two feet down. Put two feet down, Jacob. Do you understand? That's the accountability. You can see the young man's tucking under when he squats, overactive hamstring. And not good pelvic control. Where if you look at this young man, when he sits underneath, he worked way better body position. You can see he can sit into it and get his knees out. That's the biggest thing to work on. Now you think about this. When I'm building structural integrity, and we're saying, hey, you need to have proper technique when you sit down. A lot of times you go, hey, I'm going to do plyometrics to get faster. I'm going to, I'm going to engage the stretch shortening cycle. I'm going to reduce reciprocal. Then we're going to go in and you'll be faster. This is the other thing, too. When you change movement patterns, people have better force application mechanics. They have better leverage. And so when you have better leverage, you have better movement. And so we go out, it could be anybody. We do deceleration patterns, any of those different things. We went out and just did this to start, and now went out and timed the guys off this. They came out of this even at UNLV. I went out and timed them. They were faster than when they timed last spring after spring ball. They had better application. They said better application. We do the same thing with changing direction. Everything gets broken down into a pattern. If I want you to learn how to do a lateral step and I want you to learn how to sprint and take off this way, I'm going to start with a lateral push. I'm going to say, hey, push, replace, push, replace. All right, now step. All right, now we're going to drive off that leg. I'm going to start with a pattern. What's the biggest phase that most of us are in for football? Say, let's say for football. The biggest phase you're in over and over again is acceleration, right? It, it starts because you always got to start, re, stop, and then restart again. So this is the thing. We go out, and you'll see in a minute, we focus a ton of time on acceleration mechanics. Most athletes, and you, unless they naturally do it, you'll see when they get down and you tell them to jump out, when they extend one leg, they want to extend the other leg. And so we got to train them not to do it because if I'm jumping out and I'm accelerating and I jump out and I put my foot in front of me, what am I putting in the ground here? What is this? It's a braking force. So if I jump out and I can't punch back in order to drive out, I'm putting braking force in the ground. So I, listen, my acceleration is not going to be as good as it could be. So what do I want to build? I don't want him fighting against himself. So I go, how do we build great acceleration patterns? We did, and I'm going to put it up in a minute. Training. Biggest thing I look at is rate of force, but before I load anybody or do anything, I go, how do I get you in the best, most advantageous mechanical position possible? You can hit this one. Go learn how to shin angle. Can I sit down? Can I, can I shift here like this, or do I start doing this? This is ACL tear, or can I do this? I hold him in position, I make him do count. Same as the UNLV. Pro combine guys, we do the same thing, go through the same progression. Foundation, adequate straight baseline, power development, max speed, or peak power. Jumping mechanics. Dorsey flex, plantar flex. How do I teach you to dorsey flex and plantar flex? You can see he has a hard time plantar flexing before he goes to the dorsey flexion. Landing mechanics. Hey, can you jump on a box and you get off? Learn how to hinge at the hip and come off it. Arm swing, all those things I cover and talk about. Acceleration mechanics, you can just hit that. Like I just talked about. I'm going to teach you, can you get out on the first step and can you go into extension without extending your front leg? 
We build off that. We do wall pushes. All the fundamental stuff. Box blast. How do I build your acceleration pattern? Stationary sled runs. Fast foot contact. Dude went down back there, I know, it was terrible. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go to the next one. All right, so once we get done doing all those different things, at band progression two, we go to two steps, four steps, five steps. At six, we cut it off. And it's, can you hold this position, this acceleration position, six steps when you come out with band, then we strip the band off, we start using the sled, kind of like what you saw. Adequate straight base. For me, it's a little bit different. Strength is, is relative, number one, for me. And the other part of strength for me is it has a certain purpose. I'm, if I coach a power sport, how much strength do I need? Like, if I coach a power sport, how much strength do I need? I know it's going to go against some people's philosophy. No, I'm saying for me personally. And not, not that you need to answer for me, but how much strength do you need? Are you, can I, can I do plyometrics with you and get a benefit? I need a, a big enough strength base, which they've done a ton of different studies about. And when they talk about it, you look at the, uh, we said strength goals, 1.75 times for big boys, their body weight and squat. For the skill is 2.0. And this is what I've seen. If you're at 2.0, you have an adequate strength base in order to great, create great power. That's an adequate strength base for power. Ultimately, what do I want to do? What, is my, what am I trying to achieve? Am I trying to say, I'm trying to get you as strong as possible, that's my biggest thing, and you're a power lifter? Or am I going, no, I coach football. It's rate of force development. And that's at most of the power sports, is how quickly you can express your strength. That's the most relative thing. So you go, what am I teaching them? I'm going to get a strength base, and then I go, let's see how fast and how, much, how explosive we get you at expressing your strength. Football's time related. I'm an O lineman, and you're a D lineman. How long do I have to express my strength? From here to here, it's like four hundredths of a second. Who's the best at expressing strength at four hundredths of a second? I'm a running back. About four to five hundredths of a second before I hit the hole. Who's the best at expressing strength at that period of time? Same thing with a linebacker, get downhill 45, DB breaking. It's who can express their strength the fastest. Not just being strong, it's who can express that strength. And so we go into different things. Strength has one aim. Build your power potential. And your power potential is the same thing. How do I build your speed potential? And those things are the feet off each other because at the end of the day, power and speed are king. In a power sport, power and speed are king. So we go down. The ultimate goal of strength phase is to build power potential. All right? And we do a linear block. I mean, it's nothing special. It's your, your basic five, the age old at five by five, five by three. We set, you know, we've set rep maxes at the beginning of the week. Every week we have a rolling max. Can you get something new? Now, this is my caveat. Can you get something new with structural integrity? That means if a kid sits down and he cannot externally rotate his knees and sit down in a squat position and then come back up. If he cannot hold that posture, he is not going to load beyond that point. It's whatever you can hold that posture for. Because otherwise what I get into is I just loosen up his hips and I do all these other things. I get him on this massive squat and he goes down, his knee comes in, and he gets this internal rotation. Two things happen. Torn labrums, going through the roof now. You get this internal rotation in the hip socket, you get this impingement, you end up getting injury. Doing the weights. Do I want someone to get hurt in weights? No, it's not. It's, 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 man, it's counterproductive. So I go, can you hold your posture? A guy goes to stand up, he flickers. His thoracic spine gives out for a minute. He shows any shift in his hip. I go, nope, you got to drop the weight. It's whatever you can hold with great posture. And that's our strength development phase. Because I know at the end of the day, if he has integrity through his core, if he has integrity in his movement pattern, he's functionally getting stronger. Versus if I say, hey, dude, just see how you can get it up. And he does one of these, we go, yeah, man, he did 600 pounds, man, that was like awesome. And you go, nah, man, no, it wasn't. That wasn't awesome. Look at the dude's body posture. Look at the compensations he's developing. Man, we're going against what we're trying to do with movement patterns and hip mobility. Going into power work, man, one of my favorite phases, rate of force development, like I talked about. We do a lot of velocity-based training. So we'll put tendos on the bar and say, whatever you can hit for 0.35 to 0.55 meters per second, do it. And 
say you walk in, your max was 350, right? Or your worker said, was it 350? If you can't hit that .35, we monitor you. We go, hey, you got to drop the load today. That's not your max today. Your max is probably more like 345, 335. Use that because all I care about is you being able to move the bar at this speed. It protects the athlete because the monitors are based on where they're at because this is the truth. Everyone's not the same strength when they walk in the weight room from day to day. And so we go in and the guy gets underneath the bar. I go, where are you at today? Good. Then we don't have to get these issues in your kinetic chain where you're doing these compensations because you're not there today. So that's one thing. The other thing, too, with velocity-based training, what am I trying to train specifically? Am I trying to train strength speed, speed strength, speed? What phase am I in? Okay, the Tendo unit helps me to understand and to identify and to target those speeds that would be most advantageous for that type of strength. With big boys, you want strength speed. You want to be higher on the, on the strength curve, force curve. I want to be higher on the strength curve, I'll be a little bit lower on the force curve. I mean, on the velocity curve, right? I want to see that because I don't want to take them necessarily into pure speed. I mean, there's, some, there's some different variations, but I go. So when I go out there, that 10 unit helps me to do it. Looking at high force, low velocity. We always start here after we do a general strength phase. I say, okay, listen, we're going to start in high force, low velocity. We're going to work to medium force, medium velocity, and then low force, high velocity, or some combination of them. And these are the kind of things that it looks like. I will not load kids until they hit their numbers. They have to have an adequate strength base. That's in college, too. They have to have a certain integrity. If they don't, I don't load them, and they don't go into this training. So this is a guy with 95% of his 1RM were doing squat clusters. Haskell Garrett, he's over at Ohio State right now. He'll be starting next year. He's got 455 on the bar. He's looking at the Tendo unit to see his speed because he knows I'm going to drop him if he don't hit his number. He gets 20 seconds, he's got to hit the cluster again. He's got to hit the weight again. So you got 20 seconds, and you got to hit that same weight again, 95%. I'm trying to keep the speed of the bar still at an adequate level, even though we got heavier weight. Now you can see he sits back, almost goes out of it. Can't hold that. During this phase, we do French contrasting clusters, and you'll see you'll go into a French contrast circuit, clusters and oscillations. At this point, I pick up the depth of the squat through a glute bridge. I don't want him going beyond a certain point. Ten million, he's at 0.48 with that. So he's at 0.48 with that weight. He'll immediately go to a, a jump train. So go to the hurdles, he starts jumping the hurdles. Within 30 seconds of that set, that cluster, he goes and starts jumping the hurdles. We're working on power capacity now. We do this contrast training, we're trying to work on power capacity because the football power is king. On my count, they got to pause. They'll go to a Vertimax pause squat jump. We don't have Vertimaxes over at UNLV, so they put band bar, they, we band the bars up and they do jump squat with the bar on their back. With bands. You got a fast, eccentric drop in order to handle the high load speeds of that drop. So I'm here, I'm dropping as fast as I can. And then they do a 10 yard sprint or a band over, over speed acceleration jump. And you'll see there's a system that times them. So we went through, all we're trying to keep is the quality of work. What is the quality of your work? That's all that matters during this phase. High level of quality for your work. Training the nervous system to fire fast, so we give them these intermittent breaks, but then they got to go hard again. We drop down the force velocity curve now. We're medium. Medium speed, you see his reactive drop. You can see how fast he's dropping. He does one set, he's dropping reactively. 
He's got about 70% of his max on the bar. He's at 0.87 now. He was at, the other guy was 0.4. Now he's doing reactive drop squat with a broad jump. Goes to reactive squat. Now he's just dropping and driving out of it. Dropping and driving out of it. Reactive glute bar bridge. He's going to drop fast. He's going to drive it back up. This is where we make up for the lack of depth in some of the squatting. They'll go into an ankle prehab. They have an ankle prehab and usually a basu ball groin squeeze. We mix the prehab in at the end so they get three to four minutes worth of recovery because it taxes the living mess out of them. They'll do off season, do anywhere from four to five rounds of that. So you have four to five rounds of that. You're going to hit it. This is further down the velocity curve. This is higher up the velocity curve, further down the force curve. Single leg work at least once a week. And you can watch his drop. He's got bands on it. He's driving out. I put everyone on count because I monitor the quality of the work. He's going to go over. He's got a single leg squat. We got the tendos now. We go to this medium speed. We have him over on the vertimaxes now. The guy's got a single leg squat jump. And then you see the hurdles going on in the back over here. They got to come off and immediately do a single leg hurdle switch. Three down, switch legs, three. It's reactive bench press. Watch the drop. He's dropping that bar as fast as he can. Scap, this is why it's so important. Scap squeezed, sets the scap. Drop, drive it back up. Scap stays activated the entire time. Box drop plyo push-ups, same concept. High motor recruitment, some kind of jump, stretch shortening type deal, power movement, and then you got assisted. So we keep the quality of the work at a high level. Reactive jump series, he's knees to feet with a broad jump. It's a double tap. He's, when many of his hips hit, he's supposed to attack the ground and get back out of this. Not a lot of foot, long foot contact time. Knees to feet over the hurdle. I keep giving him different things. As we increase, we go up the series, higher and higher things to go over. He's knees to feet on the box. It's a progression. Split jump, isometric hold. Drive out. We progress this one too. This is an overspeed jump with split squat. We do a two feet, single leg, split leg. This is part of the contrast training. French contrast training, we do it, but also when we do complexes and contrast, we do it. It's a way to keep the quality of the movement high at the end of sets. He's doing a depth jump. They got a fast action. They'll come back off. They're liming. They got a little bit longer contact time. I tell them not to be as stiff at the ankles. It's very specific for them, which means that when they load, they're going to come down to this position and drive back out of versus having stiffer ankles when they actually do a box drop jump. We make the skill do it that way with a stiffer ankle. And then this is the speed component. Once again, now we're all the way down. On the, on, all the way up on the velocity curve, all the way down the force curve. Body weight stuff. They do an isometric hex bar, jack up the nervous system, get a high firing rate in the nervous system. There's one band on that Vertimax. We lower the weight. How high can you get the number? We're staying between 0.75 and 1.0 meters per second and 1.1 and 1.6 meters per second, given the day. Single leg control. You're sprinting, sports, you're almost in a unilateral position or split leg position the majority of the time. How do you get good at it? And you can see when he lands, he's got control of the knee. Split leg, he's, cu he's coupling this with the overspeed jumps. 
The whole point is how fast can I drop and drive out of it? Speed squat, all right? We got him sitting to a band. He's got to go full range of motion and drive out. How many reps can he get in five seconds? It's a speed focus. You'd see he's having a harder time. Bench complex. Speed, once again, he's got a lightweight. How fast can I move the bar? You're trying to get how many reps in, how many, in five seconds, seven seconds, whatever the given time is based on the system we're trying to work. You're going to see an oscillating bent row. It's a little funky, but... We do oscillations to build the relax, flex component of the muscle. Another way to build speed. The other thing it does is create stability in the joint. That's a reactive signal leg. DB drop. He's going to hold, drive out of it. Everything's lightweight, high speed. Everything's lightweight, high speed. I barely go into this with the big boys. Reactive hip flex, how fast you get it down, drive it back up. You see, he doesn't feel comfortable sitting down. And we use the Vertimax for the overload on the side. Once again, the time you use. Now it's just about speed. What can we transfer over to the field? All right, last one, real quick. Train position specific patterns. We go into specificity training the closer we get to the season. So I'm a little bit different. Undulating block, I start heavy. As we get closer to competition with anything I do, I get lighter. Because I go with power and speed are king. I don't go three reps of three at 90% at the end. I say, hey, listen, what's the highest speed I can get you to hit the season with? And people get afraid because they go, man, his max strength is going to go down. I've tested it over and over again, even in the season. Guys with high speed movement don't drop underneath, 75% didn't drop underneath 95% of their one RM because of the velocity on the bar. As long as the velocity on the bar is high, you still get a strength adaptation. It's a really neat deal. So anyway. That's the, uh, the conclusion. I'll show you these last one. I got two minutes. Last one. This is functional training. Once again, everything goes specific by the end. So we get more specificity by the end. And this is Ronnie. Like I say, he's left tackle over there with the Ravens. And all I'm doing is looking at his feet. O-line training. I'm just looking at his feet. How fast did he get the two steps down? With the, and he's got four bands on him. Overload is pulling him back. Now he's going into a set. Metabolic training, sled, 10-yard jump out. We do drop. He can only run as many as he can hold his top time. He's got to stay within 3 to 6% of his fastest time. The minute he goes underneath that, we stop the exercise. I give him 35 seconds when he comes back. He jumps out. He was at 2.6 or whatever it was. As long as you stay within 3 to 5% of that, I let him go. He started out being able to do 6. By the end, he was able to do 30. And he stayed at that level. Same time, same thing, but we just added as we went. So the biggest thing I wanted was the quality of work. That's the biggest thing that mattered to me. All right, so anyway, I know it was a, it was a shotgun shell. Uh, my time's up, but if you have any questions, I could take wait, one question. One question? Yeah, two, one. one question. Man, I've seen two hands go up, my man. So I remember your article a few years ago in the SI uh, that you did the French contrast training. Do you still implement that at uh, UNLV? I do. We don't have the same tools, man. Question? So we'll do it one more time. Say the question one more time. Uh, no, no, you repeat the question. Yeah, I'm going to repeat the question. i got to hear it one more time. That, uh, <laughs> the, the article you had in Sports Illustrator about three years ago uh, was on the French contrast training. And I wanted to know if you do it at UNLV and also when do you, do you implement that from so the question is, with the French contrast method, 
that I did over at Bishop Gorman, do I implement that at UNLV at the college I'm at currently? And then it, it, at what, what seasonal times do I introduce that? Yes? And the answer is yes, I still implement it at UNLV. It took us a while because baseline movement patterns were so bad, um, I couldn't do it last year. All right, we did some complex stuff, but I couldn't, I couldn't do that at the same depth. We're doing it now, and we're filming it. So I have footage from UNLV now, too. So I do implement it in college. It's new, once again. Uh, the pattern development is the biggest thing. I won't move on until I get a certain pattern development. And then the other question you asked was seasonally, when do we do it? I usually do the French contrast at the high force, low velocity. That way I don't slow down the speed of the movement. That's the way I make up for the slow movement on the heavy weight. As I say, hey, we're going to do these fast movements afterwards. That way I don't just drop you down into these heavy loads, but we don't have any kind of power development on the back end. So that's when I do it. All right, so it's usually about a six-week cycle, six to eight weeks, and then we come out of it. We do some kind of complex. All right? Anyway, you guys have any questions, please tap me. Uh, let me know. I'm grateful uh, to be here talking to you guys. Thanks for listening, and uh, you guys have a great day.